This single dollar will buy you 30 times more than it did in 1902. What more can you say? They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Morand, and I'll be your host for this episode. And from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, a big welcome. And as you can imagine, the community keeps growing more and more each and every week. And we thank you for your continued support. There's a lot to talk about during these historic times. And Andrew McGuire is in the house, and he'll be talking gold with special guest Dr. Stephen Lieb, who's an American economist. He's also a financial author and wealth manager. And he's appeared on CNN, Fox News, NPR, Bloomberg TV, and has been called one of the country's foremost financial experts. He's the author of many books, including Game Over, How You Can Prosper in a Shattered Economy, and most recently, China's Rise and the New Age of Gold, How Investors Can Profit from a Changing World. Now, we've included links below. If you'd like to learn more or visit his website, just click below and you'll be able to do that. And this is going to be an amazing episode. I know you're going to love it. So fasten your seatbelts. And of course, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and inside scoops that you just can't get anywhere else. And on this episode, no exception. Just before we get uh, over to Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire and Dr. Stephen Lieb, remember, please keep spreading the word about this channel by liking, by sharing, and smash that subscribe button. This really helps us reach even more people with these important topics. And then click on the bell notification if you'd like to be notified as each episode goes live. So, okay, do that right now. And so with that, let's head over to the UK with Talking Gold uh, and the one and only Mr. Andrew McGuire and Dr. Stephen Lieb. Over to you. Thanks so much, Shane. And uh, Stephen, it's just a real privilege and uh, to be with you today. And, and I really look forward to spending a little time. We never have enough time for these things, but a little time and, and really in particular, maybe because we have gold and silver in our hearts here, maybe we took, you know, revolve a little bit about the gold and silver, but look, look at today, look what's happening today. We've, we've parachuted you in on a day when <laughs> we have a major geopolitical uh, event. Can you give us your thoughts on what, what, do you, what do you see happening today? What, you know, what, what are the drivers? Well, I mean, I think that the, the drivers are, I mean, the major driver, I think, is, I mean, I hate to say this, uh, I think it's United States policy. And, um, Andrew, when we went off the gold standard um, in, in the early 70s, basically, we had all the money in the world, literally, to spend. I mean, it, it took a while for us to spend so much that it's now become a critical issue. But if you look at the uh, Fed balance sheet, $9 trillion is an awfully big number. And, and you know, basically, my, my thing is you can't be free if you have no discipline and no real regard and cohesion in your society. And we've become a society that is basically we've gone downhill. I don't know how else to put it. I hate to say that. I mean, I really do about America. And one reason I do say it is that I think we could still come back. Uh, but what you're seeing today is, is what are the results? And basically, this is all about scarce commodities. You know, the U.S. is kind of not looking very strong right now after Afghanistan, spreading itself out thinly. Uh, you've, we see uh, Russia testing them out in, the, um, in, in, in Syria, in the South China Sea, spreading them out thin. I mean, and there are all this condemnation that's going on now, when you think, and we talked about this just before the, we started uh, the show, uh, Putin came out just the other day and said, um, well, actually, no one, I haven't ever published this before, but we wanted to join NATO um, and Clinton shut us down. Any thoughts on that? I think we, we're going to have to learn a lesson here, Andrew, and I fear that the United States is going to have to take a big step backwards in order to move forward again. And I think that the catalyst for this will be, again, uh, a gold-backed reserve currency. It won't be a wand. 
the Chinese do not want a one. And, and, and I get this from reading a, a paper that was written by uh, 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 the, the head of the uh, PBOC. Uh, I can't pronounce his name. I'm terrible with language. But he was regarded as one of the, the brightest and best in China. He wrote a, a white paper uh, right in 2009 and said, the, the business of having a sovereign currency also being a reserve currency is crazy. And he pointed to the SDRs as an example of what could have served, what could have come out of Bretton Woods and what should have come out of Bretton Woods. And if you read very closely, he basically is arguing for a gold back basket of currencies, but he doesn't mention gold by name. But obviously you can't back in a world of, of where you have commodity shortages, which is really what we have today. And I, I can talk a little bit about that too. Dramatic commodity shortages across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can't back a currency uh, with something that's going to run into short supply. What are we going to back the currency with copper? As we see, we run out of <laughs> what, what sense does that make? No, gold is truly unique in the sense that it's prized, not for its industrial uses, which has some, but all those can be substituted, but it's prized for its beauty. And I'll let the philosophers decide why that's the case. The philosophers and the economists can come together. Is that a platonic uh, issue or is it an issue that we're just used to gold as a currency? Uh, I, I have no idea. I mean, you know, that enters religious, philosophical, economic realm. I just know it's true. Gold has been prized for thousands, literally thousands of years for its beauty. Not the fact that as silver, silver too, should be a massive participant because that's going to be scarce supply. We're not going to have uh, widespread solar technologies <laughs> without using silver. I mean, photovoltaics, you can't, you know, they can, uh, what they call it, I forget the exact word, but you can cut down on the amount of silver that you use. But the amount of solar voltaics you're going to need in order to get this world into a position where it can be sustainable, we're going to have a devil of a time doing that because it's just not that much silver combined its monetary value. And if you believe the world is going to continue to grow, silver could actually do better than gold. Although, mm. I don't know. I mean, I... I when I talk about this stuff, I get carried away because there's such frustration when I think about what this country did and, and, and how it gave it all up. Uh, you know, Andrew, all the technologies today that China has, and in many cases has improved on, we created those technologies. They came out of Bell Labs. They came out of AT&T, which was a uh, uh, government controlled monopoly in communications that was broken up. Now, OK, I understand breaking up something that's a threat to competition, but I don't understand not protecting Bell Labs. What we did is we just sort of shoved Bell Labs into the weakest of the uh, companies that we broke up, uh, and that was Lucent. Lucent went bankrupt and Bell Labs became a shadow of itself. Bell Labs that created the internet, created the laser, created uh, I mean, the transistor. Why do I forget about the transistor, which is the basis of everything? Uh, and, you know, for a long time, the, the company, the, the, the chairmen that ran Intel, the bosses of Intel were descendants, I mean, uh, um, work descendants of Shockley. They either worked for somebody who worked for Shockley. He was one of the inventors of the transistor. And then once Gordon Moore, or once, no, not Gordon Moore, once Grove left Intel, uh, the next person in was somebody who had nothing to do. And that's when Intel lost its mojo. I mean, it, it was so, it was as dominant in its day, and more dominant than, than, than Taiwan Semiconductor. And, and I'm not talking, 
years ago, I'm talking, you know, probably at the beginning of the century or certainly in the late 1980s, everything was Intel. Nothing was advanced micro devices. It was like sort of existed to prevent Intel from becoming a monopoly. That's why today advanced micro devices, technologically speaking, is ahead of Intel. I mean, how does this happen? How do we allow this kind of thing to happen? We allow it because we become obsessed with money and, and, and obsessed with everything that we can do and how strong and powerful we are. And you that leads to complacency, total, utter complacency. And ironically, the values that we share and, and what we're told that we want to protect by Biden in his speech last night, which is freedom and virtue. These are exactly the values that we're losing as a result of this overwhelming complacency that we have in, these con in this country right now. We have to get this stuff back. Americans, if left to their own devices, are an extraordinarily creative folks, as, as are the British. I mean, you know, the number of people, I mean, Maxwell, I mean, you know, you can go back and the West basically founded modern technology it, and the East basically now has, I, I can't say they've completely taken over, but they sure are on their way uh, to, to, to doing it. And the only way we can get it back is to discipline ourselves and we have a chance. But Steve, Stephen, you, you've just, again, it resonates so much. I mean, I, I had to, we had a, uh, joined us on, on one of these episodes was Mart uh, was Daniela Martino Booth, ex-Fed insider, very, very respectable. And, and, we, and we kind of raised the subject of the US and kind of splitting ways, going on a divergent path to Europe. And, and um, so if we just look at the gold part of that, I mean, first of all, first of all, from, from the respect of the fact that we are in Europe, on a landmass that has Russia and China on it. And obviously anything in the past, if we look at a bit of history here, is every single time there's been anything that ge geopolitical upset, primarily instigated by the US, what's happened is the migrant crisis hits, the, hits Europe. Um, now we're talking about uh, energy prices going through the roof. None of this affects the US directly. Now, indirectly, yes, but directly not. And, and so, you know, so, so you've got one side of things where, you know, we, I obviously got a lot of clients, some of these billionaires, and, and, and they're literally saying, look, we're very angry. We're very angry with the way this is going now. But the, the, the key thing is the gold side of this. Now, we tracked what's going, tracks what's going on with the Bank of International Settlements. And clearly, when you look at the Fed, and as uh, Daniela said, look, the Fed has never once discussed gold. They have no interest in gold. It is not even a part of their vocabulary. And yet, on the other side of things, Europe has gold, discusses gold, talks about backing currency with gold. The Bank of International Settlements has brought in Basel III, which is has created NSFR standards for gold, i.e. getting rid of the paper element of gold. Why are they doing this? Because they know gold has to be revalued. And they know essentially what's happened is this gold window you talked about in 1971 when Nixon uh, withdrew that window, huh, all of a sudden, because they've suppressed the price of gold through the futures markets ever since then, in fact, the futures market was started basically two years after 1971 for the sole purpose of creating paper dilution. And what's happened is suddenly Russia, China um, and smart people, including Europeans, are saying, I'll tell you what we'll do. Why don't we exchange our devaluing dollars? And we've got there is a gold window. Guess what? It's so undervalued and silver, too. It's so undervalued that what we'll do is we'll exchange our depreciating dollars quickly for anything, land, forests, gold, silver, anything we can buy. And so now we've got a divergence where we think personally, we think that that Europe and the US are at a very divergent path and it probably doesn't bode well ultimately for the US. No, it doesn't at all. And, and the only thing that I would disagree with you, I mean, I agree with you on everything you said. A absolutely. But what I would disagree with you on one thing that we're not facing inflation. We are 
our inflation rate here is actually higher than that in Europe, probably by, I don't know, 200 basis points. I would say our and I'm not talking about, you know, people that argue our, our inflation is 25 percent. I'm arguing about what the CPI is telling us. CPI is telling us our inflation is at 7 percent and rising, seven and a half percent and rising. And uh, if you look at commodity prices, which are priced in U.S. dollars, uh, they are at all time highs. And I'm not talking about oil. I'm talking about uh, commodity prices, X oil, not even including oil, are at all time highs. I'm talking about copper. I'm talking about uh, not not gold, but uh, I'll mention gold in a minute. But it, it, it's across the board, our food prices and you know, the, the, the disparity, disparities in income in this country means that people are going to have trouble feeding themselves. I mean, last night I actually heard mentioned, ironically enough, by one of the news organizations that people are talking about the possibility of wage price controls. It's almost like we have become come full circle. We, we, we left the gold standard that necessitated wage price controls. Now, after nearly half a century, but no, it is half a century, uh, we have to, we're thinking of coming back to wage price controls. And this time, I'm hoping it will lead back to a gold standard and gold will have to not just be revalued, but it'll have to be structured so that it can be revalued as we go along. And, and the reason commodities are in short supply, Andrew, I mean, I, I can't go into all the details here. I, I, I did it in my book. Uh, but, you know, one way that we use the dollar is to try and buy commodities. And that's scary. And it ha one reason we have this oil crisis today because it's because of something called fracking. Now, fracking by itself, th th there was a business there and it was a, it was a good business. But the idea was not to start a, a business in which oil uh, uh, was advancing, production was advancing by two million barrels a year. That was not sustainable. And you can look it up, but you know, my guess and other people's guess might, might not be exactly the same, but I would estimate we lost two trillion, uh, no, I'm sorry, about half a trillion dollars in fracking because of how fast we geared it up. And the only reason is this kind of nearsightedness that we wanted to be independent in oil and in energy. And the only thing we succeeded in doing is wasting fantastic amounts, literally fantastic. It's not believable how much oil we wasted and how much cheap oil that we wasted. And now today, when we desperately need this stuff, we're, we were asking Saudi Arabia to pump more oil for us because we also are constrained by these, this climate uh, change, uh, climate control, which I, I agree with. Yes, we've got to become green, but you cannot become green by banning fossil fuels. I mean, that's your major energy source. I mean, my goodness, before fossil fuels, there was coal. Well, coal is a fossil fuel, but before coal, there was wood. We're still using wood. In fact, wood is a more important energy supply to this world than is uh, uh, solar. Wood is much more important than solar right now as an energy source. And, you know, these energy sources are needed. They should not, they, they don't necessarily go away. And we have to, in order to keep, in order to have a 21st century, not just a 21st century for America and Europe, uh, but a 21st century for the entire planet, we're going to have to get to be sustainable. And in order to get there, you're going to have to use all the fossil fuels you have. And there's plenty of evidence that we basically shut in. Uh, this book that was written by Stephen Kuhlman, he was head of Jason, the Jason Society for uh, 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 the society that advises presidents. It, this goes back to Sputnik. And what a difference between Sputnik and now. I don't want to get too distracted, but uh, basically he, the Jasons are probably the most elite government advisory uh, committee that there is, and it's apolitical. And he served Obama. That was his, and Obama was, if anyone was green, Obama was green. I mean, he, he basically was, you know, 
And he came out with a book and said, yeah, it's important to do this, but there's no evidence that if we don't complete it by the year 2100, that the world is suddenly going to go up in cinders. I mean, no one knows. It could be colder, it could be warmer. Likely it'll be warmer, but the quoting the UN, the very body that won the Nobel Prize for doing the climate work, uh, their estimate, the UN's estimate is that uh, by 2100 or so, if we uh, did nothing, if, if, and, the, and the sort of middle case holds true, GDP growth will be uh, on average for those, what, 80 years, maybe a tenth or so or two tenths or so less than it otherwise would have been. Climate tra change is not an existential threat right now. It could become one. Uh, but what is an existential threat, and I mean this really, is uh, commodities. They're not, we, we don't have enough of any of them, including copper. Mm -hmm. And we're at tipping points in so many of these commodities. Copper, for example, grades are down to one half, uh, uh, um, I think, gram per ton. And if I get the measurements right, sometimes I get confused in units. But they're at the, this I do know, they're at the point where, it's starting to take much more energy. You reach these kinds of points where you have a, you know, a, a gradual uptrend and then all, a, a sort of like a very gradual uptrend and then all of a sudden this kind of hockey stick that people talk about with climate change. Well, the real hockey mm -hmm. stick is how much energy we need to get commodities. And copper mm -hmm. at one half, you know, gram per ton is there. The amount of oil we're going to need to suffice uh, and produce the kind of copper we're going to need for electric cars, for power wires, for everything it's going to take to put solar and hydrogen and all these alternatives is, is just enormous. Copper has to become a scarce metal. The only thing that can save us is if we develop Africa. And we can't do this alone. I mean, even if we were what we once were in the 70s, we would need help in doing this. But in this position, China is doing all the things we should be doing and we have to wake up to that maybe europe can wake us up i'm praying i really am i'm i'm, I'm an american i don't want to see this happen but it, it it's happening and i i i can't, i have to i mean i i just shake my head i, I i'm sort of lost for words and i'm, I'm almost teary-eyed talking about this when i think to bell about bell labs and inventing the transistor and the things that we have done in this country from the internet the trans all the stuff that could have been used for such wonderful purposes and i keep asking myself if somehow we hadn't fought that war in vietnam and if somehow we had managed to stay on the gold standard can you imagine the technologies the world would have today we might not have any of these problems they might not they they, they probably all would have been solved Stephen, you mentioned you mentioned commodities, and 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 I think, of course, huh, thinking always about silver as well. It, it, I mean, all commodities are obviously undervalued at this point. Bear, bear, bear in mind that everything we've just discussed. I understand what you're saying, but silver. Let's talk about silver for a mini second here. Not only is silver money because it has been for thousands yes. of years. I think longer um, than but, gold. But actually, it's also a commodity. And it has to be the most undervalued commodity on the planet. It, it, it is certainly, Andrew, it is so undervalued that uh, I, I've done work on silver and I've done the calculations. And, and here I, wor I worked pretty hard. I spent, I don't know, a week or a week and a half going through it and trying to realize how much uh, silver we would need to uh, uh, to create the amount of photovoltaics that we're going to need. Right now, uh, photovoltaics accounts for, I think, something like 1% or 2% of energy. It, it doesn't even account for a meaningful part of electricity. Once, you know, electricity becomes more widespread, I, I, you know, we are so short of silver just as an industrial commodity. It's unbelievable and it's not surprising. Look at the qualities that silver has. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what I think people that know the metal. I mean, it's the best conductor. It's a much better conductor than copper. 
It's a bet not just electrical conductor, but also thermal conductor. Now, you don't have to be a whiz bane chemist to realize if you're the best conductor of both energy and heat, there's going to be a lot of demand for you for, for this as a metal. And there is. And we wherever the wherever we can, we try and thrift silver. That was the word I was looking for before. We try and reduce the amount that we need, but up to a point. Once you get to that point, you can't reduce it anymore. And once you get to that point and then try and scale up what you need, you're praying for a technological miracle. I mean, I have written in a, you know, my publication seriously about the possibility of having to go to the moon to mine helium-3. I mean, because we're just not going to have enough silver. We're not going to have enough of these very basic commodities. But if you tell me silver is the most undervalued econ uh, a commodity and actually in a world that's growing. I mean, the problem with silver, if we're not growing, it can, you know, really punish you pretty quickly. Gold will not punish you to the extent silver will. But if you're growing and if you're on your way to, to, to achieving those goals, silver, I, I, I Three figure silver. I hate. I don't want to sound like some sort of moonshot guy, but it, it's 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 cheap. It's cheap at three figures. It would be today at three figures. I mean, but again, I think it's suppressed. I mean, it's dramatically suppressed. Maybe as much or Even more than gold. Eighty to one. I mean, Stephen, this week we we approached or last week we approached eighty to one. I mean, it's been at a hundred to one. Eighty ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold, and then it suddenly you suddenly think, okay, you you mentioned a three figure number. Well, of course, it isn't a conspiracy. It isn't it isn't crazy to start to think about these numbers. It's just that because there's so much paper silver, because there's been so much paper gold, um, then obviously we we sort of almost psyoped into believing, oh, the the twenty five dollars or twenty four dollars. Oh, you know that must be the price of silver. No, it's not the price of silver. The real price of silver has not yet been discovered and the real price of gold has not no. yet been discovered and and, and yeah it, 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 you know you're absolutely right I mean if you had to if, okay if you if you have to bet and I obviously want to bet that um, we're going to succeed somehow we're going to figure out a way of humanity becoming sustainable and if, if that's the case, I almost feel like, incidentally, I mean, I'm sort of giving away, not, not in a Judeo-Christian sense, but we're, we're being tested. Somehow humanity is being tested. And if, if we pass this test and manage to not necessarily agree with one another on everything, I mean, you know, when I think about the agreement and the hatred of China, etc., and the hatred of this country, that country, and whatever. I, I think of a country like Albania. Albania is half Christian, roughly half Christian, half Muslim, and it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're a mother of a Muslim child or a Christian child, you, you want your child to mother marry another Albanian. I mean, I, sovereignty is important, but some of the other things, not, not so important. They really are. We, we, we can live with people that share much different beliefs than we do. And um, we're, we're not. I mean, it, it's, you know, our immigration has made us great. And thank goodness for our immigration. Virtually every major important technology company, I'm not talking about Facebook, but I am talking about Microsoft. I am talking about uh, uh, AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. I'm talking about NVIDIA. I'm talking about any number of major technology companies. I'm talking about our, our, our best cybersecurity companies. They're run by individuals from the East. This is amazing. Microsoft was a nowhere company for about, what, 10 years until 2010 or, you know, after the bubble. And then all of a sudden, somebody from India took over. Now they're, I think, the most valuable company in the world. Oh, the one exception is Apple. Yes, they are want, run by an American. I, I, I have to say that. But Microsoft and NVIDIA, I mean, the, 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 the chairmans of NVIDIA and, Microsoft, uh, of NVIDIA and uh, AMD are uncle and uh, niece. <laughs> One's the uncle and the niece of the other. They're both from Taiwan. I mean, it's, it's amazing what... A, 
it's amazing, but it's also incredibly sad, as I was mentioning before. Gordon Moore, he, he, he was the founder of Intel. He worked directly for Shockley, or his partner uh, worked directly for Shockley, the inventor of the transistor. Where did this stuff go? And I'm sorry to carry on, but I just have to mention one thing about gold and silver. If you ask a um, hundred economists or a hundred, let me put it this way, a hundred money managers, uh, like the head of BlackRock even, I mean, you know, these people that manage trillions of dollars, etc. What was the best performing asset in the first generation of the uh, 21st century? What was the best performing asset? What would you say? Well, I'll give you a hint. It wasn't any industrial commodity. It was not an industrial commodity. It was gold. Gold outperformed the S&P 500 with dividends included. And also, Andrew, to your point, despite all the volatility and the downward uh, pressure that we saw on economies and, you know, a couple of cases, uh, at the beginning of the century, we had a big bear market. And in the middle of the century where, you know, commodities went down and silver went way down. Silver outperformed the S&P 500, dividends mm -hmm. included. Copper outperformed the S&P 500, dividends included. And even iron ore outperformed the S&P 500, dividends included. Now, I will challenge you. If you, I will bet you, uh, uh, I will bet you, uh, an ounce of gold. I'm not going to bet you paper money, but I'll bet you an ounce of gold that you cannot find any money manager in this country who will recommend any commodity in their portfolio, in a person's portfolio. It's still 60 40, 60% 60 stocks, 40% bonds, and no gold. Even though it outperformed, I mean, talk about, I, mean, I, I picked the best financial asset, S&P 500. If you're talking about cash or you're talking about bonds, I mean, the difference between gold and um, uh, uh, um, financial assets is just enormous. Big, you know, in this, uh, this next 20 years, I, I fear what you're seeing right now is the 1970s, except on steroids, because the 1970s was basically a political issue where the Saudis basically boycotted oil. They would ship us any oil. That was a political problem. We don't have a political problem today. We have a fundamental economic scarcity problem, some of which is our own doing, as fracking illustrates. But uh, this is not a problem we're going to get over very quickly without seeing commodity prices really, really skyrocket. And, uh, and, when we, and when we value, if I could just say, when we look to value gold, because obviously that's something which we, we, our universe is gold and silver. So, and obviously all these other factors are a major, are major inputs. But, but when we try and come up to a value, you know, we've got clients that say to us who are very wealthy or sovereigns that we deal with even, and they say, well, okay, so wh where do you think? And when I'm posed the question is, well, where do you think the gold, the price of gold will be? And then we're also talking about, you, you've mentioned dollar hegemony. And, and, and if you want to support dollar hegemony, uh, ultimately, you know, you, it relates to gold because ultimately the gold's collateralization of U.S. foreign obligation has now reached historic <laughs> lows. I mean, it's currently around 6%. And, and I think, you know, it, it, when it, the ratio has is always been around 20 to 40%. So, so if you actually apply those, those metrics to the price of gold, now you're looking at six to twelve thousand dollars per ounce. I mean, I'm not saying that's the price it should I be today, should but, be. <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly. So, and then if you go into 1980 levels, we were at a hundred and, if I remember right, 140 to one collateralization of, of, of debt to, to gold. So it was. I mean, that that should put gold at forty three thousand. You know, it's and, like you know, basically, I think what we're seeing here. Is is if if I mean dollar hegemony is is in, in, in on, a, on a slippery oh. slope, but I think the, the Bank of International Settlements has introduced Basel III, uh, and um, I think 
it's because they see that gold must be revalued. They see Russia, China, and the people you're just talking about, the BRICS countries, all the people who value, uh, who, who, who want to back currencies with gold, realize that, that a higher gold price is actually going to assist them, it, it's, whereas the Fed it's, is it's the completely whole, we, out to it, Andrew, I mean, thank you for that 6% figure. I'm going to use it. <laughs> I didn't realize... I mean, I, I've talked about valuing gold in lots of different ways, and I, I do come up with very high numbers, well into five figures, potentially. I mean, I think once gold, and you're absolutely right, gold is never mentioned by a central bank. It's never mentioned by our Fed. But you know who else never mentions gold in any of their conversation about reserve currencies? is China. You have to infer they're talking about gold because they're scared to mention it. They don't want to. They don't want to see gold. I mean, my guess is, it's just a guess, is that the first stop for gold, maybe now, I mean, I think we're very close to a point of inflection, but I think the first stop will be around 5,000. And we may just keep going from there as the world needs more gold because you're going to, the scarcer commodities get, the higher your reserve currency is going to have to be in order to allocate those commodities in an effective way. I mean, this whole government of the world is going to have to change, but it doesn't have to affect the sovereignty of countries. And that's what I think we have to recognize. America can get back to its basic freedoms, which we have escaped. I mean, we're, we're, we're not nearly as free as people conceive of us as being. You've raised so many good subjects today, and I wish we had even more time, but the thing is, what you're doing is, what you're actually doing, your book, uh, what you're talking about now, is providing value. This is pure gold, it's pure gold. And, and I think people have to listen, if they have to rewind, they should listen to, because some of the things you're saying here are very deep and, and need to be explored further. But I guess if I had to finish if we had to conclude with a simple soundbite, I mean, what should the, right now, what would you suggest the average person should consider doing to protect themselves right if now? If I could say one thing, I mean, it can't really be average. Well, yes, it can be. I'm sorry, no. Great question. Buy precious metals, buy the physical stuff. And I'm thinking right. even people that are, are poor in, in the United States can still buy silver coins. You don't have to spend a lot of money. I mean, if you buy a, a, a Kruger Rand, you usually have to spend an, an ounce of gold, whatever that is. It's, uh, well, it's higher today than it yes. was yesterday, but it's over 1,900 US dollars. Uh, um, that might be too much, but you can buy silver coins. And you can, you know, instead of, Instead of dollar averaging in the stock market, dollar average, or you may have to average up in silver or gold or both, that would be one thing to protect yourself. And that's what I advise. I always carry around, Stephen, I always carry around one of your beautiful uh, silver eagles. This one is 1902. And what I say, I, the reason I carry it around, as I say to people, they, I talk about silver, they go, oh, what, what's, uh, yeah, silver, no. This will buy you, this single dollar will buy you 30 times more than it did in 1902. What more can you say? Uh, that, that makes the case. And now that you're facing a world in which commodities are becoming scarce for the first time uh, um, ever in, in, in civilization's history. And the reason is it's the first time ever that 85% of the world is growing. In fact, they're, they're defining growth. The middle income countries are much larger now. They crossed the high income countries back in 2015 and now they're much larger. And I would guess in 2021, the demand for commodities probably reached the greatest ever because of the you know big boost to the world's economy well that meant middle income countries and they're the ones that are really demanding commodities they need them for growth we don't need as many commodities they're essential and they're critical and without them we'll starve but it's the middle income countries that are driving this demand and for the first time in our history the middle income countries are not only larger than the high income countries <clears throat> but growing much faster. And that's why 
this is a problem that is likely to get worse and worse until it gets better, if it gets better. And I'm praying, literally praying, that, that it will work out. So yes, I, the one bit of advice, gold and silver and physical gold and silver. Physical, 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 Go physical. Absolutely. Oh, look, look, it, it's been, thank you so much. For, for, for spending that valuable bit of time with us, Stephen. Andrew, I really I would so love to come back. I learned so much talking to you, and you're one back. of my heroes. You outed, no, <laughs> you are, you outed the, the, the manipulation. I mean, and, and, and it was risky. You actually risked your life doing it. I mean, and you talk about, I mean, I really? We, we talk about Russia poisoning people. Maybe they do, but I mean, is the West really that much better? I mean, look what happened to you for, basically just finding out something about what was going on in this very liquid market of uh, paper silver and paper gold. I mean, isn't that true? I mean, there were, if, if I read it right, I read Wikipedia, they're, they're you know, they're, they're pretty trustworthy. I mean, they weren't very happy with me. And I, I think JP Morgan as in particular, not very happy with, uh, uh, and, and of course, Deutsche Bank and HSBC and all the others. But uh, I think the, that slap on the wrist that JP Morgan got, and this, a lot of my evidence took 10 years for them to do anything about it. But a lot of the evidence and the names of the people we gave resulted in not a manipulation charge, but just a spoofing charge. And spoofing just being one of the tools in the toolbox. And, and essentially a billion, close to a billion dollar fine. What is that? A slap it's on the wrist? Taxi money. How many days of business taxi is money. that? Literally, I bet that their taxi bill, their transportation bill, I bet is a, close to that number. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, on that note, on that note, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate. And I know everyone will appreciate hearing your sage words. And, uh, and, and you ended up by saying, buy physical, buy gold, buy silver, buy physical, I, I, it rings in my ears. I'll, I'll keep that. that. That's, you know, and you did not coach me. We, that was not rehearsed. I want that to be 100% emphasized. Uh, you know, word to God. I mean, I did not know that that was what you were looking for. But if you want evidence for it, look at the performance of gold and silver versus the stock market in the first uh, 20 years of this uh, uh, century. And now I think you can actually include 2021 and 2022, given what's going on with the stock market and what's happened with gold. So, I mean, that's the evidence. The evidence is right in front of you. It's not what I think. It's not all the arguments that we're making, et cetera. It's what happened the last 22 years. And it's right, right there. That's all you have to cite. Yes, physical gold and physical silver. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. I really learned a lot from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, there you have it, Talking Gold. I promised that this would be an excellent episode, and I'm sure you're not disappointed. Uh, that's th thank you so much, Andrew McGuire and Dr. Stephen Lee. Remember, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper, gold, and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Please help spread the word about this channel by liking, sharing, and subscribing. And click on that bell if you'd like to be notified as each episode goes live. And so with that, we'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.